right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, ten years. <laughs> I used to have hair back then. Um, we'll come on to that. Just a little bit about Polar Capital for those that you, uh, of you who don't know us. Uh, we're a minnow in comparison of some of my sort of peers here who've just spoken. So $18 billion uh, under management. We're basically a boutique. So we can't turn around and say we've got the resources that um, obviously our peers you know, have here. But we do, you know, we love what we do. We're a specialist house. So we're here today, we're talking about financials. Uh, we have a technology trust and we have a healthcare trust. And I suppose to put into context um, the enjoyment we have doing the job and working at Polar is uh, one of my colleagues uh, retired last month at the age of 72. Uh, another colleague is still working at 82, so uh, we've still got quite a bit of time to go, but uh, hopefully that gives you a, f a, a flavor. Um, so we're split into regional and specialist teams. Obviously, I'm talking about financials tonight and uh, hopefully give a little flavor of you know, what's changed over the last uh, 10 years. So, uh, today versus then. Um, if you bought a portfolio of bank shares on the 9th of March 2009, you'd have made just shy of three times your money and yet not beaten uh, the equity market. Um, financials have probably just slightly outperformed over that period. Uh, real estate have, has done particularly well, insurance and you know, other diversified financials. But I thought, in a sense, uh, it would be interesting to really touch on banks. Banks represent the lion's share of the financial sector, and in a sense, that's the grubby area that we do a lot of our investment and, and trying to eke out some value and some good returns. Um, we launched the Polar Capital Global Financial Trust about six years ago. And really, it was, it was there as a way, a low-risk way for investors to play the recovery in financials. You know, post the financial crisis, a lot has gone on, which I'll touch on. And we saw it as an opportunity. It's a very unloved sector. It's very, very cheap, for good reason in some cases. And we saw this as a way for people to get exposure. Um, income and growth. So it's going to be a bit different from some of the other speakers. And we've got you know, facilities there to invest, you know, obviously to leverage, and we've got ability to invest in um, unquoted investments. So we've got a, a exposure to Atom Bank currently. Um, so wh what is it invested in? Um, just some examples, uh, guess the flag. Um, I think you can work out most of those. Um, obviously, a couple of the previous speakers talked about banks like um, HDFC. We own it, we think it's a fantastic business. AIA there, obviously Asian Insurance. We own MasterCard. Again, another, you know, a, a great business there, which we would happily talk about later. Um, but thought really, well, actually we own AJ Bell as well, which we bought at IPO. But um, I thought really, it's really, you know, if you want to understand um, what's changed in the banking sector, you know, since the crisis. Um, how have we done though over that period? So when we launched the trust back in 2013, we've compounded about 9% per annum. So for all the negative sentiment that you hear about the bank sector and about financials, it's actually been eking out pretty good returns. Um, we've delivered about 7% compound growth and dividends over that period. And we put up here you know, the alternatives and we launched the trust to some of the UK banks. So when you think about the financial sector, don't necessarily think about it through the prism of what you see in the news in the UK. Uh, and as you can see, you know, HSBC aside, it's been quite a, you know, uh, a difficult period for the banking sector. And yet we've produced you know, a lot better than that, showing you the significant opportunities uh, outside that. Um, we're a trust, so we trade on a discount on a premium. So <clears throat> today you can buy the trust on a, on a discount on a discounted sector, so 5%. And what's different about um, the trust in comparison with the previous speakers, is we have a fixed date with destiny in May next year. It's a fixed wind-up. So when we launched the trust, we wanted to say, look, here's an opportunity to invest in financials. You can have your money back in you know, six and a half, seven years' time. What we're likely to do prior to May next year is offer shareholders, with their support, uh, an opportunity to continue their investment in a very similar vehicle with a cash exit. So the nice thing today is you can buy the trust. It's not a recommendation. It's just an educational point. Uh, you can buy it on a discount of 5%. And obviously, you've got that certainty that you can have your cash back at NAV prior to May next year. And obviously, if you'd like to continue investment past that, we'd be very, very happy to, 
take your money. Um, so wh wh why today? Why, why own financials? What's the opportunity? I mean, there's a couple of, you know, there's a few points I'll go into, but there's probably three that are worth uh, remembering. One is balance sheets, which have materially changed since the financial crisis. Secondly is risk. Investing in the sector today is materially different. And finally is obviously the impact of, you know, technology and what, you know, what's happening there and what that means for, uh, for the sector. Um, so touching on balance sheets, and this is key, really. I mean, the, why, why did we have the financial crisis? There was a number of key issues. One was the sector lacked uh, sufficient capital. It lacked sufficient liquidity, and it was lending money to anyone with a pulse, which, as we realize, doesn't work very well. Um, today, if you look at U.S. banks, that's on the right. We helpfully removed U.S. banks, so make it harder for you to realize that. Um, you have to go back to the 1930s to a time when banks had as much capital as they did today. So you would need, I mean, you know, it's, it's, you'd have to go back that far. So never has, it, never has there been a point when they've had more capital. In Europe, uh, maybe the 1990s. So banks are significantly better capitalized. It's removed that tail risk, you know, from, a, from another downturn of, you know, what we obviously saw 10 years ago. Um, liquidity, we haven't got a chart here, but you think again, uh, Northern Rock, um, you know, think of those queues outside their branches that was driven by a lack of liquidity. Banks are now forced to hold much more liquid assets. As a result, again, you shouldn't see the same thing happen. It's not to say there aren't specific banks, you know, we discussed this Lee earlier, that have capital liquidity issues or issues around their sovereign, but, you know, the sector as a whole is, is in a much stronger position. Um, now, post-financial crisis, obviously, one of the sort of uh, headwinds for the sector is you've actually seen very little loan growth. Um, now, the flip side of very little loan growth is actually banks don't need to retain capital to underwrite new loans. As a result, payout has gone up significantly, uh, dividends and buybacks. So on the right there, you can see U.S. banks, you know, material uh, payout ratios going back to shareholders. And the buybacks alone are resulting in earnings per share for U.S. banks going up 6 to 8% a year before they've even done anything. So that's a big driver of earnings going forward, regardless of obviously what they've done on fee income and, and, and loan growth. Um, so again, this is a positive. Big, big dividend yields coming out, and that makes, you know, we think makes a, the sector much more attractive. Um, the other thing is really, and the other key take point as I was touching on is risk. So when you think about when you invest in a bank, you're, you're effectively investing in a leveraged business that has lent money to households, to corporates, and so forth. And risk has materially changed. On the left, you can, what we've got here is what they call non-performing loans. So the number of loans that are in default individuals, corporates. And you've seen this trend has just continued to go down and plateau. And wherever you look globally, maybe outside you know, Turkey, uh, Argentina, you know, generally, the global economy has been benign, so fewer people are defaulting on their loans. Um, the warning sign uh, for banks getting in trouble is when they lend too much. And what this complicated chart on the right has tried to show is the correlation between banks losing a lot of money is perfectly correlated with loan growth. Um, if you can see it, that's 2008 up, and nine up there. Um, and today we're down here, so very, very different. Now. Up there, you obviously heard names like Ninja Loans, Liar Loans, Self-Certified Loans. Uh, Northern Rock had a product called the Together Mortgage. You could borrow 125% of the value of uh, uh, the house that you were buying. So not surprisingly, the banks got into difficulty. Today, it's very different. A lot of that risk they can't take on their balance sheet from regulatory reasons or just from their own risk appetite. At the height, just before the crisis started, um, Chuck Prince, I remember he had this sort of saying, uh, the music's still on, so I'm still dancing. Well, uh, leveraged loans, which has been a concern in, obviously, obviously newspapers recently, uh, the banking sector had $450 billion sat on the balance sheets. Today, it's less than 80. So it's an 80% fall. 
Um, auto loans, again, an area where they've obviously seen some, some sort of anecdotal evidence of lax lending. Again, in the US, 80% of that doesn't sit on banks' balance sheets. So you think of auto finance companies. So banks have significantly de-risked. You're buying a much more attractive uh, business when you buy a bank share today. Um, fintech, technology. Anyone here guess which is Royal Bank of Scotland's busiest bank branch? Uh, maybe it's in London. It's the 704 train from Reading to London Paddington. Uh, it's just highlighting how much has changed when you think about banking today. You know, it's all done on your mobile phone. Obviously, the, the, the need to go into branches has, has reduced materially in the last few years. So fewer need for fewer branches, smaller branches, means the ability for, for banks to you know, cut their branch network. Obviously, that has consequences in some city, you know, for some people. Uh, but they can still provide services to the vast majority. So we give an example here. The Scandinavian banks have been great at doing this. So DNB, which is Norway's largest bank, has closed about 80% of its branch network since the financial crisis, and it hasn't lost any market share. Um, if you go to Stockholm, I'm told, I haven't been there recently, you, know, you can't find anywhere who accepts cash. So it's this transition from people using cash to cards. That's the cost, one of the big costs for banks. And the more, you, more people use their mobile or online banking, it's the ability for banks to obviously reduce costs and offset some of these sort of difficult headwinds that we have currently. Um, Fintech, obviously there's a lot of talk about startup banks, things like Monzo, Starling, Revolut, if any of you have come across those. Uh, what's interesting in the US, um, Bank of America, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, each spend 10 or $11 billion a year on technology, of which upwards of $3 billion is on sort of R&D and software. So it's very difficult for some of these startup banks, it's not to say some of them won't succeed, but to acquire customers because the incumbents can just copy what the startups do, and if that's your only advantage. So the success of Revolut, for those who've come across it, which is basically a free FX, you go abroad, you don't pay your 3% uh, to Lloyds or RBS, is great. Uh, obviously, you need a very uh, kind venture capital backer to pay for that. Now, that's not to say you know, those businesses won't succeed, but what we're finding with some of the tech and um, VC startups is the attraction of partnering with a bank means you immediately get access to their two or three million customers. You immediately potentially monetize that opportunity and reduce the downside risk. Whereas if you go out alone, you potentially got to obviously fund those losses. So uh, big opportunity for, for banks to, to fight back against some of the startups. It's not to say that there won't be some, you know, there are some great businesses that come out there transfer-wise as such. Um, but again, it's a lot is going on. It's not to say that um, you know, there aren't opportunities there. Um, so really, you know, why today? Why buy a financial, why buy a financial trust, uh, apart from you can buy it on a 5% discount? Um, really, the opportunity is that the sector sold off uh, quite dramatically last year. It underperformed quite materially. Um, and you can kind of slightly see it. This is a PE chart for US banks. And uh, it's obviously driven by where we are in the economic cycle. So people worried about, you know, we've had a very long extended recovery from the financial crisis, worried about perhaps political concerns, Brexit, Italian politics, trade wars, uh, quantitative tightening, et cetera, being withdrawn. And understandably, a lot of generous investors have probably taken money out of cyclicals, industrials, banks, and put it into more defensive stocks, healthcare. And as a result, the sector's significantly derated. So for a sector, certainly banks, that trade on a probably a 20 25% discount to the market, uh, it's down to about a 40% discount mark, uh, at the moment. So we think the sector's already pricing in a recession. So if you don't see a recession over the next you know, year or so, then the sector, to us, looks fantastically cheap. If you do, then we think it's priced in. Uh, the question is, you know, is it? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, so have we bottomed? Um, someone kindly has gone back to 1937 uh, on the right-hand side here, 12 recessions in the US. In eight of those 12 recessions, uh, banks underperformed in the year preceding the recession, and in eight of the 12, they are then outperformed in the year following, sorry, the year 
of the recession. Not quite the same eight. So surprising, you know, it's not surprising. The market is a discounting mechanism. People are worried about a downturn. They sell those cyclical businesses and then start buying them back as the recession hits. Now, the two outliers when banks didn't outperform during the recession, uh, surprisingly, financial crisis, early 90s, um, property crashes. Uh, we're not envisaging that, but even if it does happen, uh, banks' exposure to commercial real estate is materially less today than it was, um, obviously, back then. Um, bizarre statistic, during the early 90s, um, housing correction here in the UK, um, Halifax and Northern Rock grew their profits every single year despite the housing market crash. The banks that lost money, Bank of Scotland and Barclays, was all on commercial real estate development, property development, you know, and obviously business loans. So, you know, it does surprise actually, so the, you know, the sector can actually um, surprise. Um, just a chart here saying obviously dividends, uh, you know, again, highlighting how, how high they are relative to previous times when they've bottomed. Um, so, it's a global fund, it's predominantly exposed to um, the US as the biggest exposure, big banks like JP Morgan, Bank of America, MasterCard, as we showed earlier, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a very broad spread. When we launched the trust uh, six years ago, we had 22% in emerging markets. Obviously, common sense, we've got to put that back at some point. Um, I mean, long term, yeah, I agree with what Austin was saying earlier, there's some fantastic growth opportunities there. We own HDFC, we own AIA, and we own you know, a number of others there. But you know, we think it's an unloved uh, sector. It's incredibly cheap. And uh, there's quite a well-known investor called Warren Buffett. Um, he has 40% of his investment portfolio in, in US banks and other US financials. Uh, at the end of the last year, he put 15 billion buying J.P. Morgan and PNC, which is the seventh largest bank in the U.S. And he said he's you know, he, he finding it very difficult to find value in markets. So I'm not necessarily recommending you put 40% of your portfolio into financials, but um, you know, you can't go too far wrong <laughs> having a small exposure. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, just to the highlight here, a couple of the larger holdings. We show book value here. And, um, you know, it's quite a surprise JP Morgan didn't lose any money during the financial crisis. And obviously, because they're cyclicals, these businesses are much more volatile. But, you know, we think it's a really interesting opportunity at the moment. So, thank you very much for your time. And I'll be around later. Thank you.